As you might know, a lot of the uh, early assessments uh, were primarily driven by natural scientists, even uh, IPCC for the climate change. In fact, we did an analysis on seeing what's the involvement of social scientists, and I think it had risen from about 10% in the first assessment to about 25% in the latest assessment, which is still far below. If you look at the IPCC and in terms of what it has uh, contributed to, to, to the whole debate on climate change, and then if it, it's been now for about 50 years, and if you look at the impact it has had on policy, and if you look at the impact it has had on on the, on the general society, has been very limited. And the minute that there was some uh, discredit, it, it was immediately picked up. The reason is it, it takes humans out of the picture. Yeah. So it, it, it talks about we being the main cause of climate change, but it doesn't talk about some of the benefits, some of the, uh, it, it's all a matter of trade-offs. And natural scientists will not be able to bring that dynamics into the, into the situation in terms of how um, much of the industrialization that has happened over the last hundred years, it has benefited a lot. It has actually uh, improved the welfare overall, in general, of uh, uh, the population. But it has also had a lot of impacts on some segments of the population. So the quest, you know, the, the social sciences, the human dimensions brings out these critical issues, and which, which really ha is important because we cause the problems, we are the ones who are going to have to solve it. So we have to bring the recognition that we are the major drivers of this uh, processes. The same thing with ecosystem services and biodiversity, in fact, much more. And the thing, and then the second thing is the only once we understand our actions, what makes us act the way we do and we will be able to uh, design the responses. The value goes beyond just monetary uh, valuation. It goes beyond just putting a, a dollar value. It talks about social values. And I think economists uh, uh, can do two things. Uh, well, let me say three things. First is, trying to get the uh, a rough idea of the monetary value of a particular ecosystem service. In fact, they can even uh, go to a point where they can actually advise policymakers on which ecosystem services or components of biodiversity should be valued, and which should not even be, uh, oh, sorry, should be priced, and which should not even be priced. Um, things like uh, flood regulation, water purification, you know, these are all the so-called regulating services. These are life support systems. So I, I find it a little bit ironic to put a, a, a dollar value on a life supporting system. But it is of a, a tremendous value for the survival of human beings. So to make that distinction. Then the second is to pro bring in the whole uh, aspects of non-monetary valuation. And there, are, there is a growing uh, group of economists who are addressing those issues together with psychologists, behavioral economists, anthropologists. So it shouldn't be in the realm of economics. It should be a transdisciplinary approach, a team that will, should address, so brings in all the different aspects. The third component, which I think has always been a little bit ignored, and in, in fact, many economists have shied away by saying that this is not what economics should be doing, is to look at the distributional aspects. Uh, when I say distributional in terms of how the benefits are distributed across different groups of people. And you get into the, into the realm of political economy, but that was a very strong foundation, in fact, of the early fathers of uh, economics. It was, uh, it was to look at how different people have access to different resources and how it impacts them. So, you know, uh, some of the most uh, famous economists, uh, recent economists like Amartya Sen, uh, Stiglitz, Joseph Stiglitz, I've been really concerned about the distributional issues. We just cannot focus just on allocation. We have to uh, allocation from an efficiency perspective. How to get, how do we allocate resources in the most cost efficient way? Sometimes you'll have to draw, sit back and say, sometimes it may not be, you may have to allocate it accordingly to the needs of the people and it may be a little bit less efficient uh, process. I believe you can, and it, then it goes down to the institutional governance aspects, 
Yeah, and uh, in fact, we can get a lot of uh, guidance from um, the one that I really liked, and I'm sure there are many others around. Is the South African? Uh, uh, they had a, a review of their natural resource management, especially for the water, focusing on their water policy. And the way that they did was that look, they, every human being needs a minimum amount of water for survival. So you got drinking water, but you also need minimum amount of water to keep say uh, clean for health reasons. And this has been there's been a lot of work done by the WHO on this. So that's that they figure is actually a um, uh, uh, human right from a human rights perspective. So that. Every human being should have access to that. And then once you've gone past that, then you start going into the realm of markets and sort of saying, okay, then it's based on how much you need because right now then you're going into the economics in terms of uh, making use of water for making profits and other kinds of uh, benefits. Then you start introducing the a, a pricing system. So you have a combination of human rights, and then working together with the economics. I think the scarcity of resources will basically make the, the, this whole notion of political boundaries uh, redundant in, 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 uh, in the future. And it's the, most co it's the most inefficient use of resources where you have political boundaries which basically uh, uh, are sort of setting the, bar, the, bar, the boundary for in terms of use of the resources. So if you have an example would be if you go to a country which has got uh, uh, huge amounts of uh, fossil fuels and, and, and so you, and you get into a situation where they, you go into the, uh, let's say during summer, the air conditioning is at a point where it is freezing. Then you go to another country without uh, fossil fuels, and and, they, and, it, and and it makes no sense in terms of one's going one extreme and versus the other extreme. So, coming back to the role of the U United Nations, um, in a way, uh, I think it is going to have more and more prominent role. Unfortunately, it is now playing more prominent role in conflict resolutions around the world. But um, but I guess when those conflict resolutions are really tied to uh, scarcities of natural resources, then the UN will actually would need to have new frameworks to look at the underlying problem, not just to resolve a conflict, but uh, underline the root causes of the conflict. And if it's natural resources, then they will have to have a much bigger role. The UNU is, a, is an interesting um, uh, organization without, within the United Nations because it does not have member countries as as principal um, members, like United, United Nations Environment Program has its governing council, which is representatives of, um, of countries. Same thing with UNDP and many others. Uh, so the UNU, in fact, I see it as a flag bearer in terms of bringing these kind of new radical ideas in terms of reform of the governance. This is where some fundamental research should be done. Uh, not fundamental research in the way of um, you know, like physics and mathematics, but in terms of fundamental research on the science policy interface. And if you look at the mandate of the UNU, it was to be the, the, uh, the, uh, the academic uh, think tank for the United Nations. It, it, has to, it hasn't really lived up to that, um, and I think it, it's starting to move towards that direction, but I think there's a lot more that it can do. And it needs to get a place within the other United Nations agencies such that they do take into consideration what UNU has to say. And one more is capacity building. UNU's new with this new revised charter on uh, providing uh, degrees and um, uh, as a degree awarding institution, it, it is, I think, has a responsibility at a global level to build the next generation of scientists that understand the science policy interface and the transdisciplinarity. Much of the dynamics of the ecosystems, biodiversity interaction, and in fact human livelihoods actually occurs on those, uh, on those very local scales. The challenge here is uh, 
people talk about, um, I think you use the word traditional knowledge. In fact, the anthropologists in our group were saying that that's too broad and well ill defined. They use, I think, um, indigenous and local knowledge. That's what the terms that they use, and that's what we use in this uh, the last five days. And we have a lot of things to say on, on that in this document. But the challenge would be for IPBAS is to set up a process whereby the information, whether it is uh, written information or whether it's tested information, how is that documented and validated by not the scientific community, but by that own community. They set up their own standards, they set up their own uh, verification system, and based on that system, the ones that pass that part, uh, bench test will be used in the analysis. Because it doesn't mean that all local indigenous knowledge is going to be good knowledge. You need to even uh, validate that, just like we do in the scientific uh, arena. So I think IPBES, there is much talk about in IPCC, but I think in IPBES we have identified, actually we have recommended uh, a, a subgroup, an expert subgroup, to actually look at this and to provide some guidance on this validation process.